Um, I didn't have it on record. The reason that, the reason why homosexuality is so prevalent is because a lot of homosexuals have money. Therefore, they have power and they have influence. They can influence the parties because they have enough money. <laughs> so wherever money is, power is flowing. Right? So think about that. Even poor people follow money. So if we have a king who, had, who is in charge of all the money, and he controls the society. Therefore, whatever the king says is okay, everybody says it's okay. Well, wait, wait. Yes. I heard what you just said. You said whatever the king says is okay. Yes. Then everyone else everybody says it's okay. Says it's okay. But there are times that everyone else says it's okay, and the king is forced yes. to say it's okay. Exactly. <laughs> That, that have, well, that's in our society. That's yeah, why I said I wanted, yeah. That's why I wanted to bring it to where we are and say, are we really being controlled by the leadership or are we being controlled by the money? But mm -hmm. even with the story with like when Jesus went to they put Jesus before Pontius and Herod. Right. The people that were trying to make a choice. The people with what? The people went against what they were saying. They with what? Money. They didn't, well, they didn't have money. It was, it was all people. Okay, so... Let me give you, a, for instance, the king has a bunch of peasants that come to him and say, kill Jesus. The king is actually going to kill Jesus for the word of, of, some, of some peasants. Really? Yeah, he asked them not to. He said they asked them not to say what their value was. He asked, yeah, it doesn't. But yeah. we understand, just through history, if you study history, we understand that only people in power have influence. The Sanhedrin court were a people of, of, of the Judeans who had power. Even as the children of Israel, they were in a position of power. Therefore, they carried influence. The, the Pharisees, look at Paul. He had influence with the government because as a Pharisee, he carried a position of power that actually had money connected to him. See? So they influenced the government like that. They, they're able to get in and say, well, King, I think in fact, what do you read most of the time in the Bible? The king has always been influenced by prophets yes. and people in high, yes. high authority. And you can't get to those positions without having something in your pocket. Because people ain't going to listen to you. That's the bottom line. They ain't going to listen if you don't have nothing in your pocket. Yes? Even the president of the United States, when he gets elected, he has a, a preacher to come and pray over him. To speak into his life. Does he call me? I was about to go there, but he ain't gonna call you no name, preacher. Not that you know name, because they just don't know your name yet. So, <laughs> so I'm saying, the guy that got him on with the inaugural guy, and then he didn't have him come right. and give him to do the inauguration. Right. You know, he didn't take the, the Chicago black man and have him come do it. Who did he have to do it? He had a white man. Do it. See, uh -huh. see, what you say? Works, you know? I have five years for it. <laughs> I'm saying something. Uh, I'm trying to set the stage. So God is not upset um, with Israel. Well, He is upset with Israel, but he, He's He's not upset in a sense that they're just all jacked up. He's upset in a sense that they have followed the ways of the world. That's what He's upset about. The kings have influenced them to. Leave God and follow what the, the rest of the world is doing. Right? But he doesn't even believe them. That's what you're saying. Huh? I mean, he said, Oh, no. No, I'm just setting the stage. So I'm trying to say where, where they are right now. And I want to say that in order for this message or this lesson to have meaning to us, we have to ask ourselves the question, and this is what I want to pose as something, that, uh, something for you to think about. What is it or what areas in our life are we following the world system rather than following God's system? And, and we think it's okay. There's nothing wrong with it. In fact, let's think about it on a bigger level. What areas has the church, the body of Christ as a whole, begin to follow systems of the world and have left the word of God and what God stands for? That's easy. Yeah, people living together without marriage. Uh, 
homosexuality and married in the church now. Uh, and women being pastors, teachers. I mean, you know, as far as that's still, you know, that's debatable. That's yeah. debatable, yeah. Okay. Uh, those are two ways. Uh, what else? Well, I'll come to immorality in the church, yes? <laughs> he said all the good ones. There's more. There's more. Uh, prostitution in the church. Prostitution in the church. No. No. <laughs> He's looking at me like, gambling. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, but y'all not saying Gambling. Y'all not do saying something. Gambling in the church. Some people, you can drink. Alcoholism. Alcoholism in the church. Some churches, you can drink. Uh, some religions, you can drink. So you can gamble, bingo on Monday nights, Friday nights. So we're we not following the system no. that has been put in place by wicked hierarchy. No. And how does God really feel about that? When we allow that stuff to come and flow in the church, and we say it's okay. We say stuff like everybody. Oh, here's one. Come as you are. Everybody's welcome. That's actually not biblical. It's not biblical to, to, to there's nothing in the Bible that says come as you are. Wow. No. Search it. Huh? Yeah. And brought it wow. to the church and the church accepted it. It's like Jesus comes my heart. Come as you are is not in the Bible. <laughs> the, somehow somehow people over time, develop this belief that God is so good that he would never hurt or never uh, do anything wrong to hurt people. There's a theology about it like that. And so because of that theology, they infiltrate other things into the church that puts God on this pedestal that he's all good and there's nothing wicked or, or right. you know, hurtful in God. Yeah, I don't know if this is off the subject, but I'm not going to mention that. But there was, you know, this guy named Daddy Grace. You know, I've heard of Grace, yeah. the church. Of, I was Googling it today. I was looking at the old pastors and stuff. And he had a scripture, a little thing, a motto that said, God wouldn't feed the people, so I did. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And he was, he was, it, it turned out he was a cult leader in the uh, cult church. That's how we were talking about cults and church at work. And so right. we started Googling some stuff. Okay. And that came up. Somebody yeah, was thinking that because God is not doing what he's supposed to be doing, that he has to do this. You know, Daddy Grace. Daddy Grace and uh, there's some yeah. Father Divine. Father, yeah. 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 Yes, sir. Yeah. I've heard it you can come back tomorrow, but then you've got to change. So, that's yeah. not in there. Well, huh? yeah, the change part is in there, but yeah. come as you are, it's not in there. Yeah, they take come as you are, like if you're like in your sin or whatever, or you're messed up, or then people even take it as. People always make excuses. I don't have anything to wear. Girl, God says, "Come as you are." That's you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, I got all I got is party clothes. All I got is you know the tight clothes. And people get ashamed. So people have adapted that. God says, "Come as you are, baby." So you can wear that until yeah. the change comes about. So you start starting to realize. You know, you start taking your hemline down a little bit more and buttoning up a little bit more. That's what That's they exactly. use the connotation. Of so as you are. there's a song they used to sing in the grand old Church of God in Christ. And they used to sing this song. They said, this is the church of God in Christ. This is the church of God in Christ. You can't just join in. You got to be born again. This is the church of God in Christ. Now, you just can't join in. You got to be born again. Reborn again. Right? Because no man can come to the Father except the Father draws them. Right? So when we invite people that have not been drawn, mm -hmm. that's like inviting evil into the church. Wow. But we don't think like that. I know. But we like, oh, we got to go out and win souls. Right. We got the harvest is plentiful and the labors are few, and we got to go out and get them. You still got to be led by God. Wow. Wow. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> You gotta be drawn though. See what happens so the is the person comes up and say, girl, I need to find a church and ask the person that's really looking for God or or to be a way for somebody that's really going through something. Now here, here's here's how it works. Here's how it should work. Your prayer life and your relationship with God should be so intact that God will always put people in your path that 
that you need to connect with to bring them to where they need to be. That's how it's supposed to work. So you're just never out. Remember, Jesus went and chose his 12 disciples. He didn't just go out and get a bunch of people and say, come on. No, he went and chose them. He went looking. Oh, you, 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 come follow me. Everybody chose him that job. Right? But uh, all the other people were just coming along for the ride. And he ministered to them, but they didn't stick with him. In fact, every time they tried to stick with him, he said, come on, let's go. I got to go somewhere else. And he'd leave them right there. <laughs> See, we always, we, we got this vision that, and God does want, don't get me wrong, God does want the Holy Glory to fill the earth. He wants the world to be saved. He wants that. But we have this vision that we must draw them in by the group droves when really what God is trying to do is bring us into relationship with him so we can know who he is or his are. Wow. Jesus made a statement. He said there are some that have left us, but they left us because they were not a part of us. People that are not called can't stay. <laughs> It don't even feel right in your spirit, do it? She said, everybody is God's child. She said, don't even feel right in your spirit, does it? There is evil in the world, and there are some children of the devil out there. Jesus said, there's some people like this, absolutely, that you just cannot say. Like, it's just so hard to say. Well, let me just make this statement, and this is seven. You can't save anybody. <laughs> so that that shuts that down. So there are some people out there. First of all, only God can save them. Second of all, you ain't gonna have any influence on them at all, except you do what God tell you to do. And that's why it says one plants, one waters, but it is God that gives the increase. People are just assume it's trying to turn you away from God. Yeah. Before listening to you, trying to convince them there is a God. So I listen to people at work all the time. I'm not going to argue with them. <laughs> and they can't convince me that I'm serving the law. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. ain't no way in the world. Remember what Jesus said? He said, whatever place you enter into, if you're not receiving, shake the dust off the feet and keep moving. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> everybody's not going to receive you because everybody's not called. No. Jesus said, they asked him, why are you speaking in parables? He said, because, yeah, they, everybody's not going to hear me. He said, only the ones that are called, only the chosen ones will hear me. Some will hear but he said, everybody's going to see, but they're not going to perceive. Everybody's going to hear what I'm saying, but they're not going to understand. Only the ones that God has opened their eyes will hear what I'm saying. See? This is why you got, and you know why that's deep? Because if you really think about it, how, what God did to choose you. You are not here by happenstance. You are not here because God, you know, was said, hey, just come on. No, he had to carefully <laughs> pass this person, pass that person, go pass this person, and go, you, you, it's time for you to you. get your life together. It's time for you to get back in church. It's time for you. You lost up. You, you know, it's, this is personal. <laughs> Everything you read about, oh, you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do do y'all get that? Do you see how deep that is? That God, in his infinite wisdom, would choose you over the crowd? You think you're just sitting here just because it's Bible study night? Because you made a choice to come to Bible study? You, is that the reason you think you're sitting here? The God of the universe, the God that created heaven and earth, and everything in it, the God himself got involved personally in your life and got you to this place tonight. You don't think that's deep? <laughs> you think about thousand places, thousand places you've been, a thousand yeah. places you could be, but you're sitting up here on Wednesday night. Think about people that have died. 
your age and younger. People ain't even made it this far. And you've been through the same stuff. You've been in some of the same situation. Some of the bullets were right next to you. Jesus. Hallelujah. But God dispatched angels even before you were born and said, I want you to protect this one. Yeah. I don't care if they get involved in drugs. I don't care if they get involved in alcohol. I don't care if they become prostitutes. I will dispatch an angel yeah. to protect this one until they wake up. <laughs> I know I have some angels on my side. Woo, my God, my God. Now, Jesus. So, so, the stage is set. Here's the stage. God has picked you out. God has given you a life that you ought to be living, but you're being pulled on because the society or the system of the world has a different way of living. Which one is going to work for you? Right. Because the life of God is a life of faith and trust. And the life of the world is a life that's dependent only on what you can do. Uh -huh. Just like the children of Israel, because they were this unfaithful wife, little Jordan 1 in Bible study, we're talking about this very same from Sunday school. Right. And it gave the example of Hosea. Right. God told him to marry a harlot, right? That's so it. he marries Gomer, right? And then she does the right duties. And then she has children and everything. And then she gets drawn back into the world. Mm -hmm. Okay? So she's back out here doing her little thing, husband and prostitute. And then he's like, why would you tell God? Why would you tell me, you know, God needs to divorce his wife, put her away. And God's like, no, go get your wife. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. To go out here and make her a righteous woman. Right. So he had to actually, and that's what God wants to do with Israel. He's not going to just abandon Israel because they were a harlot to him. But right. he's going to make them righteous. Trying to do. That's like Gomer did with Jose did with Gomer. He made her a righteous woman. He could have yeah. left her, he could have left her in her mess. He could leave Israel in his mess at this point. Right. But he wants to make it righteous. Exactly. So, exactly. God wants to make us righteous. Righteous. Or he wants us to choose to be righteous. Yeah, amen. Because it has to be a choice. They're connected. You know, the new update, they connect the phone and the yeah. iPad and the computer. I'm surprised the computer didn't start right now. It's just all about fancy. That new upgrade. Yeah. 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 But anyway, <laughs> back to righteousness. Back to righteousness. Back, back to God not leaving us out there in the cold uh, to die. And God is not leaving us. We have, a, as y'all have mentioned earlier, we have a lot of things that have have infiltrated the church. And leaders have allowed the infiltration to come in. And that's one of the things that God told the children of Israel in the third chapter of Jeremiah. Uh, after he talked about how the leadership had come and messed them up, he says, I'm going to give you pastors after my own heart. In other words, I'm going to give you leaders that will feed you with wisdom and knowledge and bring you to true understanding of of being what it means to be in right standing of God, with God. And so this is why we have to be careful um, as we're going through things, that we have to be very careful that we're not always following the crowd. Right? The Bible says, broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be that go in there out. Yeah. Narrow. You know, and it's, but it says, there's narrow, straight is the way that leads to life eternal, and only a few people find it. Look around you. I was actually I was getting ready to say something yeah, along people, those lines. For young people, I mean, I like Pastor. What's his name? Uh, more, more. Yeah, it's awesome. But it's just you know, it is. A, it's, a, it's a young people are drawn there because of the the, the, uh, the gotcha. You know what I'm saying? It's just the, the gimmick, the gimmick, and the fact that you have these these uh, singers coming in like high tripping and all them that come in like once a month. It draws them in there, but it, they're there for the wrong reason. 
I'm on the World Wide Web, but I'm going to say something. <laughs> It's okay. It's okay. Because y'all know I don't bite my lip about too much. Let me tell you something. And y'all need to hear it. Um, church leadership has gotten wicked. Yeah. Okay? And I'm not just saying this just to be saying it. This is true. When we're talking about church prostitutes, um, there are prostitution going on in the church, and the prostitution is toward the preachers. So preachers have a wife and girlfriend on the side. So, except, yeah, sometimes two or three. This is stuff that's really happening in the church, in the city of Columbus. Okay? Uh, and I'm telling you this because I'm a pastor, and sometimes I'm around some of these pastors, who got this going on? And they don't see a problem with it. Because it's been going on for so long. Many of you don't know. The man we honor, our great civil rights leader, had a problem keeping the zipper up. Yes. This has been a trend. God is not pleased with it. No, sir. That's what the end of the end of the to do something. Anyway, I think I got power. But my point is, do you see how things just keep going on as if nothing is wrong? Life is still going on as if there's no problem. People are still filling up those churches by the groves. People are being drawn to those places where they have leadership that don't care nothing about your soul like they're supposed to. See, your soul does not get fixed because I stand up here and talk to you. Your soul gets fixed because you get to connect with a leader that's living right. Jesus did not go out and get a bunch of people to preach to. He went out and got a bunch of people that would follow him everywhere he went. They saw everything Jesus did. They were acquainted with how Jesus lived his life. Therefore, it changed their lives. And if you got a leader that whose mentality is to do what I say but not what I do, that's a problem. I had a pastor years ago that used to say to me, say this congregation all the time, if you want to know how to live say, watch me. And I adopted that. I'm like, yes, I'm going to become holy so that people can watch me and know what God desires out of their life. I don't want to be somebody that just talks. I'm going to be somebody that lives. Because this is a lifestyle. This is not a job for me. This is not a nine to five for me. This is not something I just do to get paid for. This is my lifestyle. It's the way I live. It's the way I carry myself. It's the way I breathe. It's the way I associate. It's the way I work. Even when I work in the secular world, I'm still being holy. I'm not cutting corners. And I, I mean, I, I don't mean it. But this is a problem that's going on. This is a problem that the children of Israel were going on. They were connected, and people were okay with the way it was. Yeah. Jeremiah comes in and said, listen, y'all are but, and I'm going to just say it like it would sound in today. He looked out over the children of Israel or over Judah and said, y'all are a bunch of hoes. They ain't like that. Yes, ma'am. Just like us. They're okay with it until it gets real bad and they realize God is no longer with them. That's God is no yes. longer in them. Yeah, they're okay with it until oppression comes. Because and, and then at some point they realize this is not right. And remember when we talked before and God said your own sins is going to correct you? Yeah. Your own iniquities. But see, you know what? People... Turn to Jeremiah, um, Jeremiah, Revelations real quick, Revelations. We got to read Jeremiah 8. We're going to get there. We, we still got time. Uh, Jeremiah, we're going to read, but go to Revelations chapter, I want to say chapter 3. Right. Make sure I got the right one. Talking about one of the churches. Uh, the Indian churches. 
starts. I'm sorry, chapter 2. Look at me, I'm just hard. I'm re- looking at these numbers, but I'm reading them wrong. Uh, nope, that's not the one. Somebody read that. Because thou sayest, I am rich. I am rich. I got money. Look how big my church is. Look at how many people are following me. And increase with goods. Uh Uh-huh. I got got my new bins and got my big house. And have need of nothing. I don't need nothing. Read. And knowest not that thou art wretched. This is God speaking to them, saying, you're not rich like you think. You're wretched. And you're miserable. And poor. And poor. And blind. And blind. And naked. <laughs> see, what we see with our eyes is not really what it looks like. Y'all remember, y'all remember the movie The Matrix? Y'all remember when he first showed Neo, the very first time he showed him what the real world looked like? And he literally got sick to his stomach because he couldn't handle it? Because it wasn't what it looked like. He's walking around thinking everybody got the suits and ties on, everybody's having a good time. And he pulls that, pulls the fly back and says, This is what it really looks like. And all you see is darkness and gloominess and just a mess. He says, No, this can't be. That's what a lot of people look like in the spirit to God wow. that you think have it going on. Yes, ma'am. I think they not only look like that, to be honest, but they feel like that within themselves. Yeah. Especially when it comes to pastors. Mm-hmm. And they don't know how to express themselves or tell anybody to feel like there's more on their level that will understand. Yeah. That, that's why you hear about these preachers, like the one in Georgia who recently committed suicide. He, I believe he was in a Lincoln or something like that. He had a big old church. You, you find these pastors doing all that. That's not what's going to satisfy you. It's your relationship with God. And the children of Israel would always get away from that relationship with God and then turn back. And they'd get away from it and then turn back. And that's what's going on now. But some folks ain't turning back. No, because they're not. I'm glad you asked that, because we all need to understand something. One of the things we have to understand is that God doesn't always deliver us all at once. Okay? So we'll get saved, or we'll come to God in repentance, and God will take some things away to show us that he can. But then the scripture comes up that says, if you love me, then you keep my faith. So then there's things that God allows to stay for you to make the decision that I'm not going to do this because it's against the word of God. People sometimes don't want to do that. And if we preach a doctrine 
And here's here's a, another false doctrine that's in the church. We all got issues. Nobody's gonna be perfect till Jesus comes. Y'all heard that stuff right now. That's false doctrine. And what it does is it allows people to stay in a condition that they don't need to be in. Right. Because let me tell you something, when you experience your real change, when you experience your real transformation, it's not going to feel good okay. to do it. It's not going to be something you just fall into. You're not going to wake up one morning and all your lust is going to be gone. Right. Not going to happen. It's something you're going to have to work at. It's something you're going to have to continually push toward because the enemy's always going to be there fighting you. Yep. And so some people give up on the fight too soon. Yep. They go, well, I've been trying for years and it ain't nothing happened. And, and so I must, this must be the way he made me. And, wow. and preachers do this. And, and then, what, if, what if you don't know what I'm teaching you right now? Because I'm teaching you this from experience. I'm 49 years old. I've been saved for almost 30 years now. So, and I've been living right for a long time, and so I understand the struggle. But preachers who have not gone through that process, when they start preaching, especially at a young age, and they have not met up with the trial of life, remember Jesus said, we all must bear our own cross? When they haven't bore their cross, when they finally do bear their cross, they don't know how to stand up in that pain and believe God for their deliverance. So you know what they do? They hide it. Because you know, all of us do it at young age. We hide it. We cover it up. You just went through, I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm going to throw some things out there. You young, 20-something years old, and one of your parents died. And it affects you. It's supposed to. You're supposed to cry. You're supposed to be affected. But because you're pastor. You decide, I'm going to cover this up and be strong for my family. All you're doing is pushing down pain. You're pushing hurt deeper inside of you. Later on, because you pushed it in there, it's still there. So it's going to be coming out little by little. And what I mean by little by little is that if you're married, now everything your spouse does begins to irritate. Y'all better hear me. <laughs> and so now, not only did he did he not deal with the issue of his parents, now his spouse is irritating him. And because he's a pastor, he's got all these women in the church that are doing everything for him that his wife won't do. Wow. Pain on top of pain. So what does he do? Because he can't tell nobody. I'm struggling with lust. You know, the death of my mother woke up lust in me. He can't go tell nobody this is what's going on because he's a pastor. Him and his wife are at home fighting because he's struggling with lust and she's supposed to satisfy the lust, but she ain't doing it because he's been oppressing her because of the pain of his mama. So she ain't comfortable being in the bed. See the cycle? See? This is why the Bible tells us to confess our faults one to another. This is why the Bible tells us that we're not to forsake the fellowship of the saints together. We're supposed to come together all the time and share not only the good stuff, but sometimes share our hurts. Share our pain. Share what we're going through so that people can be set free. The only way to get free from what you're going through sometimes is just to talk about. Your answer is in your mouth. <laughs> and the reason that people get locked up in the crazy home is because they never talk. And when they do talk, they're never talking about what they ought to be talking about. That's why I said statistically, I always share this, statistically, statistically, only in the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church has less people that go insane than any other church in the world, any other religion in the world. Why? Because they confess. They go to the priest and say, Father, forgive me for I have sinned. What did you do, my child? I shot somebody. Somebody died. I, I slapped my mom. I slapped my kids. They'll tell everything. And it frees them. They're no longer carrying that weight because they got it out. 
But we, somebody gonna talk about me. Yeah. There's something I try to do here as a pastor, especially, I, don't, I haven't said it in a while, but I try to say it to all my preachers, especially to the preachers. Please don't think that if you tell me something that you think is going to be literally, that I'm going to be literally. Amen. Memory is short. No, don't worry. Okay, go ahead. What you said? Memory is short. Oh. But my memory is short, but it ain't short, it ain't short when it comes to grace. That's what you need to understand. My memory might be short, but not when it comes to grace. I understand that everybody in here is wrong. I'm not telling you, trust me, I'm not telling you you're going to become holy overnight, because I did. It was a process. Okay? But I don't want you to... to uh, I don't want you to position yourself to think that it's okay not to be changing all the time. Don't, don't be this person that says, please be patient with me, God is not through with me yet. Don't be that person. <laughs> okay, if you know God is dealing with you about something, then don't nobody need to be patient with you. You just need to stop. <laughs> There's no patience necessary. Now, if you don't know, that's different. But if you know, the very fact that you're saying, please be patient with me, is a, a sign that you know. <laughs> I've been dealing with this anger for a long time. Please be patient with me. No! Get it under control! <laughs> I'm just being serious. <laughs> no, no. I mean, there's just certain things that we, we've adopted again, this, this world coming into the church. Not everybody. Not everybody. Not everybody. Is it? I mean, God, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. But if you read your scripture, really read your scripture, there are certain things God only imparts to people that are loving Him. Do you know the scriptures in the Bible that says, don't even pray for them? That's the word. Jeremiah chapter 11. Yes. Says, don't even pray for them. Well, let me see. We don't, we don't like scripture. These scriptures are in the Bible. Yes. If I have a person in my particular church who just makes up in their mind that they're just going to stay disobedient, I don't have to pray for that person. I can actually put them out because you're wasting my time. And energy. Get out. Serious. I mean, we, we don't like this kind of stuff because we, in our society, we have been taught stuff that only society has brought in. It, it didn't come from the scripture. But it makes so much sense. You know, I teach a missions class out of World Harvest, and I was reading a chapter in this book, and it was dealing with probably one of those. Uh, It was dealing with the idea of us walking in unity, right? Having a, a, a relationship with one another. And what messed me up about the chapter in the book that I was reading is that the guy, his scriptures did not line up with what he was teaching. <clears throat> because all the scriptures was talking about being in a relationship with Jesus. But he tried to make them seem like they were scriptures talking about us being in a relationship with one another. Now, I don't, don't get me wrong. I believe that we ought to have a relationship with one another. Amen. But I don't believe we can have a relationship with everybody. Amen. You see what I'm saying? Amen. And I think he was giving off that kind of, you know, that kind of thought. And I'm going, but this scripture doesn't line up with what you're saying. See, you ain't got to believe everything you read in the book. You got to check it out and make sure it lines up. So I was challenging the class. I, I asked him, I said, any of y'all read the chapter? Yeah, I read it. I said, did y'all agree with it? Because <laughs> I didn't. Which chapter was it? Oh, this is in another book. In my missions book. Yeah. But I'm making, the point I'm making is that somebody was teaching something that was supposed to be biblical, but it was not biblical. 
And anybody else who would have read it said, well, this must be fine. He's using scripture. But the scripture didn't line up with what he was saying. And people will do that to you. They'll put scripture all over stuff. People will preach Daniel in the lion's den and say some stuff, and you'll be like, yes. Can I mess you up about Daniel in the lion's den real quick? Let me tell you what the problem with that story is that we've been hearing it preached all our lives. Here's what the three Hebrew boys said. King, no. Even if God doesn't deliver us, we're not going to bow down. That's what we've been taught. That's what we believe, right? And so we walk around saying, even if God don't deliver me, I'm going to serve him. That is not what the three Hebrew boys said. Not the, that's not it. The three Hebrew boys said this. They said, our God will deliver us. That's what they said. Then they said, king, talking to the king now, not to God. King, even if you don't throw us in the fiery furnace, we're still not going to serve you. Go read it. All our lives we heard preachers preach it, and we've accepted that we have to bow down and say, well, maybe this is not the will of God. How many times have you backed away from the will of God because you used the word if? It is God's will that you be healed. It is God's will that you prosper. It is God's will that you have peace in your life. It is God's will that you have joy in your life. And you should never back down from it. It is God's will that you always walk in victory. Amen. We are always triumphant in Christ Jesus. Amen. We are more than conquerors through him that love us. So why am I saying if? Amen. But we've been taught that since we were kids in the church. Even if God don't deliver me. That's not what they said. They were talking to the king, not to God. They said, king, if you don't throw us in the furnace, then we're still not going to bow down. <laughs> but you see what I mean about you hearing stuff? See how the world creeps into the church and causes us to doubt God? Causes us not to have confidence in God. So we walk around as these little weak people wondering if God's going to do it or not. Is God really going to bring me out? Is God really going to heal me? Is God really going to cause my limbs to grow back? Is God really going to fix my headache? Is God really going to get this cancer out of my body? Is it really his will? Yes, it is. No doubt in my mind, and there should be no doubt in your mind. Whatever God wants to do for you, if it's in his word, it is for you. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall prosper in the thing that I send it. So if God sends his word, and the Bible says he sent his word and it healed them. So if he sends his word to heal, you don't have to say, if it be his will, I'll be healed. You say, no, I will be healed because he sent his word to heal me. I'm sorry, I'm getting excited. I'm, I, this is supposed to be Bible study. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I, I'm just saying we got a problem because we've allowed it. I'm trying to set you up because this is what was going on back then. And God, Jeremiah standing up before the same kind of people saying the same stuff. Jeremiah is just not preaching gloom and doom. He's also talking about what God is promising them at the same time. And they're missing it. They're rejecting it. They'd rather stick to their own system. Doing what they've always done. Doing what works. Thinking that they're rich. Thinking that they got all the stuff they need. Thinking that they don't need nothing. I don't really need God if I don't need nothing. But he said, look at you. You're wretched. You're miserable. You ever know? Rich people kill themselves. Yes. She just got done talking about the pastor with the big church. He, he's not the only one. A few pastors with big churches yes. in the last year have been blowing their brains out. Yes. How do you have all that money and all that success and kill yourself? Because you're miserable and poor and wretched and naked. Is that what 
what you want, we got to, if we're going to get it, we got to get it right. <laughs> See, I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with having it. I'm saying you get it the wrong way. You're using the world system to get it rather than using God's system to get it. I like God. <laughs> so here's a people that needed to repent. Let's read these first eight chapters real quick. Just read through them. Let's do it, uh, what do you call it? Uh, how do you do it on Sunday? What do you call it? Responsible. Yeah, that's the word. Jeremiah chapter 4. Jeremiah 4. Okay. Mm -hmm. Verses 1 through 8, right? Mm -hmm. Four. 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 If thou wilt return, O Israel, saith the Lord, return unto me, and if thou wilt put away thine abominations out of my sight, then shalt thou not remove. And thou shalt swear, swear the Lord liveth in Jerusalem, in judgment. And the nation shall bless themselves in him, and him shall be Lord of For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground, and sow not among thorns. Circumcise yourself to the Lord, and take away the foreskins of your heart, ye men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire, and burn that none can quench it, because the evil of your Lord. Declare ye in Judah and publish in Jerusalem, and say, Blow ye the trumpet in the land, cry, gather together, and say, Assemble yourselves, and let us go into the defense cities. Set up a standard for Zion, retire, and say now, for I will bring evil from the north, and a great destruction. The lion is come up from his thicket, and the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. He has gone forth from his place to make thy land desolate, and thy city shall be laid waste without an inhabitant. For this courage you wish to thy cloth, a method and power, for the fierce and anger of the Lord is an honor and an honor. See that? God said, I ain't. What I plan to do is get ready to happen. Yeah, it's already too late. It's already too late. All you can do is start crying. Yeah. Aren't you glad it's not too late? Yes. Wow. Check it out. He says in verse 3, For thus said the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground and sow not among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskin of your heart. Now, what God is talking about here, what what God is trying to get them to understand is that Judah has been living a life. They had How do you say it? No, they, they, they had a. Oh, here it was. They had a form of godliness, but they denied the power thereof. You have to understand. Judah watched Israel go through what they went through, and they even judged Israel. Uh, yeah, Jerusalem or Israel for what they were going through. And they were actually doing the same thing. But they thought they were being God. Yeah, they were still like worshiping idols at that time. Yeah, but they thought they were okay. Because they, they saw what happened to Israel and they're like, well, that's not us. We got them together. And so he tells them, break up your fallow ground and sow not among thorns. Now, what that who sows, who goes out and plants a field while the weeds are still out? Right. Jesus says, you can't take new wine and put it into old wine. So what he's literally saying is that the children of Israel were trying to take on God's righteousness without fixing their heart. They're trying to take on and do what God wants them to do, but they haven't changed anything in their heart. I heard a preacher, and I, I'll call his name out, because, I mean, he, he speaks the truth, even though he got some issues. Um, <laughs> now I can't even remember his name. But anyway, this preacher made a statement, and it was so true. He says, if a person is a thief, and they go to school, and they're still a thief, they just become an educated thief. Right. Uh -huh. If a person is a thief, and they come to the church and get saved, and they never 
change the thief, then they just a church going thief. Wow. Because the thorns are still in it. The heart hasn't changed. You cannot take on things of God unless you take something off. Right. They refused to give up a lot of things. There you go. They wanted to keep the system. They wanted to still worship their idols. Yeah. You know, their hearts were hard and they gave God, but they didn't want to go his way. They didn't right. want to change where they are. So, so they had to their heart. They had to really open their heart back to God for us, right? Right. So the, they needed to repent. Yeah. That was the, that's the key word. And repentance means what? Change your what? Change your mind. Change your mind. Change your mind. Repentance means to change your mind. It doesn't mean to say I'm sorry. It means to change your mind. Yeah. Now, changing your mind is not easy because changing your mind is not talking about changing the knowledge. It's talking, now I'm going to even go deeper than that. It's talking about changing the subconscious mind. Remember Sunday when I was preaching, I was talking about what you instinctively do. Right. right. Well, what you instinctively do, I cut it off from here. What you instinctively do is in your mind. It is in the heart of your mind. And the only way to change what you dis instinctively do is to change what's instinctively in your heart. Did you catch that? So you can gain knowledge of the truth, but never change. Mm -hmm. See, here, here's a good way to think about it. The Bible says this. The devils believe and tremble. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the devils have a knowledge of who God is. They have a knowledge of who Christ is. But there is no instinctive change inside of them that causes them to change themselves because of what they know. So you can know something, but your knowledge is not the key. The key is to take what you know and begin to practice it until what you know becomes instinct out of your life. That's how you change your mind. You get it? You don't change your mind by reading a book. You change your mind by doing what the book says. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like, 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 we're trying to, trying to be a cook. You can't just read the book and take your dog back to the cook. You got to do what Yeah, you got to follow the instructions. Yeah, and you got to practice. Yeah. Because even reading a cook, cookbook is not the secret to being a good cook. Reading a cookbook is the secret to fixing a good meal. But that don't make you a good cook. See, I, yeah. See, one time when I was trying to impress my new girlfriend, who is now my wife, I was talking over there. I made a phone call. I called home. Say, how do you fix this? Wow. And I fixed some steak smothered in gravy. I mean, I, I, I fixed a meal. My wife was loving it. But I can't cook a lick. She came home a couple weeks ago. The house was full of smoke. I was trying to fix chicken. I didn't burn it. You know what? I undercooked it. I thought it was burnt because the house was full of smoke. It was too hot. was too hot. I can't cook. I, I do not have the instincts of a cook. Wow. <laughs> and I acknowledge that because it is not something that I practice. How would that smother stay? Pastor? Well, he's he got me now. <laughs> yeah, I don't have to fix that anymore. Yes, it does. That's all I'm saying. I can't get it no I did. I, I actually cooked it. You had to get the directions. I had to call. I had to, how do you do this? How do you smother it? How do you? Oh, and so right, she okay. gave me step by step instructions. Okay. I'm making a point. Just because I did something doesn't make me a master of it. Right. The only way you become a master of something is if it becomes practice. The only way that's going to change your subconscious mind is if you keep practicing something that goes against it. Mm -hmm. What you normally. Yes, you 
you got to keep doing it over and over and over again. You know? Right? If you're having a problem, define who this. Huh? Right. Okay, Ryan, that's a good one. If you have a problem with life and you feel like you always got to be the person that tells the best story and all that kind of stuff, then you got to force yourself to start telling the truth, even if you don't get no response from it, right? I'm sure RJ and, and, and my wife, well, I know RJ, I don't know how women do it, but I know when we first joined the military, uh, when you're in, that, in the MEP station, you hear all kinds of stories, don't you? All you kinds of You hear it in prison, too. Oh, when the prison is all the You hear all the stories. When you're in the, uh, in the like, at the break in the county jail, yeah. you're like, what y'all just do that? There's no have all that money on day. Well, and what I mean, well, well, what I was saying is that some of these stories, and the reason why I was referring to the military is because some of these stories happen to be about what it means to be in the military, about being a soldier. So you hear all these stories, and then after you go through basic training yourself, and you get on active duty yourself, you're like, what in the world are these jokers talking about? You know what I'm saying? All these stories, because people try to make themselves look good. They're lies. And I can guarantee you, if any of y'all have ran into a lot of military people other than myself or my wife and they're telling me stories, I can probably guarantee you that probably 50% of what they told you was probably a lie. And they can get away with it because you don't know no better. Yeah. They can get away with it because you don't know no better. You're like, oh, that's pretty cool. Ain't cool. They're lying. <laughs> but okay, so you want to get free of lying. So you got to force yourself to tell the truth. Right? Even when it don't sound popular. Even if it's going to get you in trouble. Wow. I remember, I'm glad you used that because I did. I used to be a liar back in the day. And I remember when, back in the day. Uh, so I remember, I remember when God started talking to me about telling the truth. Well, one of the things that started happening to me when I started telling the truth was little stuff like being late to work. Now, you know, being in the military, you're not ever supposed to be late. You get know, Article 15, right. all that kind of stuff. So I said, I would have to trust God. I can't go in there with a story, right? Because we can always go in there and say, hey, my car broke down. I got stopped by the police. I got a ticket. I remember all the stories I used to tell. I had a flat tire. I had to see my flat tire. All the stories. So now I'm going in there telling the truth. And I'm trusting God because this is my faith. I'm going to tell the truth, God. It's going to hurt, but I'm going to tell the truth. I get in there. I'm like, where you been? So I got woke up late. Well, just get over there and lie. Truth to be, you Yeah. You got to remember a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I would be late and have myself prepared to tell the truth, <laughs> and God would fix it up so I wouldn't have to say nothing. They didn't even recognize I wasn't there. <laughs> what am I trying to say? When you start doing things God's way, God will start giving you faith. Yeah. And you ain't got to spend all your time, like he said, trying to keep a lie straight. Yep. What did I tell him last week? Yep. What did I say? Let me make you, you got to start writing up things down on the board. Last week I told him I had a flat. This week I told him I got stopped by the police. This week. <laughs> Just tell the truth. I'm late. I woke up late. I, you know, they all see the truth. <laughs> this is what I mean by the system of the world. Everybody's doing it. Everybody's okay with it. Everybody's okay with the way things are. Y'all know what? Can I tell you somebody that don't have a problem with identifying who people are? Doctors? They don't. Doctors don't have a problem with identifying who people are. When that baby is born, that doctor walks over to that mother and says, here's your girl. Or here's your boy. He don't have a problem with that. So why do we grow up and have a problem? And why are we being so understanding to say, well, some people are just born. No. The doctor knew what you was when you came out. Born a quarter girl, that's it. That's it. That's the end of the story. End of the story. That is so good. I like that. But here's the problem. Instinctively, we have to change.
change that thinking. Right. I don't care what happened to you when you were young. I don't care if you were abused. I don't care if you were molested. That's not the point. When you recognize what you are based on what the doctor said, that's what you are. So you have to go back and retrain your subconscious mind to get in line with what the Word of God says about you. That's the answer to homosexuality when people, you know, they start asking, I've been called a born woman. Well, that's not what's between your legs. <laughs> well, I mean, but part of that is just identity. People don't understand their identity. I think I was born to be a woman, so I, I need That's to way out there. You know, they got this couple. They had a couple of kids this day where he said he was born to be a, a woman, and she was born to be a man, and they're married. Yeah. And then he carries the baby. He, she, whatever he got out to. Right. So, because she's a woman that became a man, but she kept her private, you know, all that. And he was a guy that didn't change. You see that? And, and he, he kept it. So, because they got married, he kept his stuff so it worked. And then she, she carried, as a man, the baby. So, it was just like, it doesn't make us beyond any kind. Yeah. That's just funny. But that's, that's instinct. That's, that's crazy. That's bad instinctive mindset. Did you catch that? It's bad instinctive mindset. And we have the ability to change our mindset. And that's what repentance is. That's why he says, you repent. I'm not going to repent for you. You have to do it. You have to instinctively change how you think. Right. Does that make sense? That's what we have to do. We cannot look at the world and go, Oh, that looks nice. I think I'll change my thinking to get in line with that. But the world, the system tries to everybody, even the kids at a young age, with this program, you yeah. have to go on SpongeBob. It tells them like little, little choices that you make that confuse their gender and stuff. And it's okay. Yeah. So they're already falling into the world system because they see it on TV. Just little things like that. And then they go to school and think that you have parents and then their boys to school dressed like girls. Yeah. Their girls to school dressed like boys. And it's confusing, but it's the whole system yeah. that they're implementing. I remember I grew up, I watched G.I. Joe. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? The Wonder Twins. That's yeah. super great. Now they got these demonic cartoons that don't make any sense. And you got SpongeBob's friends carrying purses or guys, you know what I'm saying? Or just stuff like that. And kids are getting confused. Well, let me tell you why kids. All the way children. Just, can I tell you the TV? Hold up. TV is not what influences our kids. Y'all got to remember this. TV is not what influences our kids. It's not It's us. It's the parents and the community of the church. If we provide the foundation of truth, we we'll don't have to worry about what entertainment does. If we provide the foundation, if, if the children are able to come to a healthy church, and see healthy marriages, healthy relationships, we don't have to worry about them getting caught up in that stuff. But if we're always at home fighting, if we're always at home in confusion, and then we go to church and put on a fake act and act like we got it all together when we really don't, then our children see that fakeness, and then they become fake. That's why God held Israel responsible for their own repentance. Because if they would repent, everybody else would get in line. You cannot take this word that I'm giving you, this word that you hear every week, and put it into a, a body that's not willing to change instinctively. You've got to make up in your mind that you came into this place to be changed. Amen. And therefore, it may hurt. But you, but can I tell you what makes it not hurt so bad? When you have a vision. When you have a vision of where you're going, it takes less pain to go through what you have to go through to get there. Yeah, me too. Where's Isaac at? That's why I'm going to Yes, ma'am. It would have been here five minutes. <laughs> He was, he was influenced by women. 
Solomon's weakness was the women. And men, and that so the so enemy so. used the women to turn him away from God. And with his own money. With his own money. That don't make no sense. No. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the love of it. Yeah. Is the root. The root. Oh, well, because money answers all. That's the good one. Money answers all. How many of y'all believe? Let me ask a question. How many of y'all believe that we're really doing something different? Yeah. Y'all, y'all believe that something different is happening here? You're going to have to stick with it. You have to stick through hard times and you have to stick with through everything else to stick with what God is doing. I mean, this is for the church, but even as believers, I mean, you guys have been through some stuff over the years. So yeah. it's growing for you guys too. Exactly. Yeah. We're ch- Listen, I, I truly believe this. I am, I keep myself in a position to grow continually. I want you to understand that. I keep myself in a position to grow continually. That means that I'm always changing. I'm always coming into new revelation about myself, about where I am, about where God wants to take me. I'm always seeking God about me. And as I am doing that, God also allows me to help bring you to the same place. Because I'm not trying to get there on my own. One of the things that I remember that was written in the scripture that God said um, to Moses and to, to um, Joshua, he said, divide the inheritance among the people. Wow. Yeah. So the idea is not that I grow a church and become somebody famous. The idea is that we as a body become the church of God and we all become famous. We all walk in the blessings of God. We all enjoy the blessings that God has bestowed upon us. The body of believers and not just on believers. I am only brought here to help bring you to where we're going. You know, so as God is showing it, and, and this is the amazing thing that you have being here. You are allowed to be in a place where God is bringing you step by step out of little things that you thought you would never get free from. You understand what I'm saying? Things are happening and you're getting knowledge about stuff that you probably would have never gotten on any other occasion. Because sometimes when people become famous, they forget how to tell other people how to get there. Amen. And they just enjoy where they are, and they, they give all these great speeches and all these great sermons that, that are not instructional enough to bring the people where they need to be. You know, my wife gave me a word this week because um, she, was, she was sharing with me that God, I guess God meant, well, it was a word from God this week. God was ministering to her about telling me to become comfortable with what he's doing with me. You know, because sometimes, you know, it's not that I want to be like other preachers. Oh, it, that's not the case. It's more like I just always want you to be excited. Because I'm always excited. But sometimes when I'm ministering, my words don't always end with that excitement. And so sometimes that affects me. Does that make sense? But I know she was sharing with me, your word is getting across. People are listening. And then she said this. She said, you're just like the other preachers who don't do that anymore. You know, and she was talking about preachers who already have a platform. Does that make sense? So I'm sharing that with you guys and say, hey, don't back off now. Don't get into yourself now. I'm trying to give you step-by-step instructions on how to get to the next level. And if you don't back down, we're going to all go there together. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Come on, give God a hand for us.